Hello and welcome to the session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we're going to be looking at elimination of intercompany bond holding. This topic is covered in advanced accounting and it's definitely covered on the CPA exam. As always, I would like to remind my viewers, which is you, to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you don't have a LinkedIn account, I strongly suggest you create one and connect with me on LinkedIn. YouTube is where you would need to subscribe. I have over 1,500 accounting, tax, and auditing lectures on YouTube. Please subscribe, like my lectures, share them, put them in playlists, let the world know about them. If you are benefiting from my YouTube, then other people might benefit as well. Please share the wealth. This is my Instagram account. Please follow me on Instagram as I'm trying to grow my following. This is my Facebook. And definitely you want to give visit my website where I have special discounts on CPA courses. What is the big idea and do you need any prerequisite? Well, maybe. If you're not familiar with bonds, I strongly suggest you go to my intermediate accounting and review your bonds. You want to make sure you are comfortable with your bonds. But assuming you are comfortable with your bond, we need to know how it works. Basically, one company issue bonds. So what does it mean issue a bond? It means they borrowed money. So let's assume one company borrowed money and they received cash $110,000. So they debit cash credit bonds payable for the face value of a hundred thousand then they they have a premium on bond for ten thousand dollars so this is the issue in company we issued a bond and we received one hundred and ten thousand now this bond now is on the market one of our subsidiaries one of our affiliate purchased that bond from the open market Okay, when they purchase the bond, um, they're going to debit investment, whatever they bought it for. Investment, let's assume they, they purchase it for 105000 and they are going to credit cash for 105000 Now, this company is our subsidiary. So this, is, this is the parent company, and this is the subsidiary. Now, technically, if the subsidiary bought back the bond, it is as if we have bought the bond. It is as if the parent company bought the bond because do those two entities, the parent and the sub, they'll be consolidated. So that's the overall idea. That's the overall idea. Now, remember, the parent company will have interest expense because they have to pay interest on the bond. The sub company will have revenue. So the parent company will have to pay interest expense on the bond and that interest expense is going to the sub as a revenue. Well, again, we have, we have expense and we have revenue. They have to cancel each other out. We have an investment and we have a liability. They have to cancel, they have to cancel each other out. So this is the basic idea or the big idea about this chapter. Let's dive into the details. So an affiliate company may purchase bonds issued by another affiliate. So we have one company buying the bond of their affiliate. Guess what? Intercompany bond investments, which is a receivable, which would have a receivable, and bond payable has to be cancelled against each other. So the issuing company, they have a loan, but the loan is held by the affiliate. So we have a liability, they have an asset, they have to cancel each other out. One company pay interest expense, the issuing company pays interest expense. The company that bought the bond will receive interest revenue. They're both intercompany. I am kind of kind of paying myself. So all these must be eliminated. Okay. So bond not held by external parties are viewed as being constructively retired. Although the, the issuing company did not buy them, but since our affiliate bought them, well, guess what? It's as weak as, as it's as we bought them. They are constructively retired. Okay. So this is viewed as an early retirement of debt. Now, again, this is a good idea to go back to my intermediate accounting chapter 14. If you don't know how what how to retire that, I strongly suggest you go there. Now, I'm going to cover how to retire that here, but it's a little bit different as if you have only one company, okay? So, let's go back to basics and illustrate an example about bonds. Just illustrate an example, just to make sure you are familiar. Now, if, the, if what I'm going to be going over his, here is confusing you, guess what? You need to go back to my intermediate accounting. So, a three-year bond with a par value of 100000 was issued on January 2nd. 2010 for 85,000. So it was issued at a discount. The bond pays 7% interest each December, assuming straight line, straight line amortization. So this is the amortization table. This is the carrying value at the issuance, 85,000. The bond pays interest of 7%, 7,000, 7,000, 7,000. That's the cash. 
We have discount of total 15,000. It's going to be amortized a straight line, 5,000 each year. And notice the bond carrying value go back to maturity when it when it mature, which is 100,000, goes back to the par value. So this is basically a basic, a real basic amortization table for a bond. This is what the issuing company would enter. The issuing company will debit cash 85,000. They will debit discount on bonds 15, and they will credit bonds payable 100,000. So this is the issuing company, the company that issued the bond. Then they have to pay interest every six months for $7,000. Then they have to amortize the discount, which amortizing the discount will increase interest expense. So notice, amortizing the discount, when the discount goes down, our interest expense goes up. So we're amortizing the discount. So those are the entries that the issuing company would make for having that bond. They will, they'll have to pay cash and they'll have to amortize the discount. Now, we have the investor. The investor is the company that bought the bond. The company that bought the bond made an investment. Therefore, they have they increased their asset by 85,000 and they would reduce their cash because they paid 85,000. Now, every six months, they would receive, actually, sorry, I, I didn't mean to say every six months, every year, I guess the bond pays interest every year. Every year, the issuing company pays them 7,000 in cash. So they will debit cash and they will credit interest revenue. Now, now also they bought the bond at a, at a at a premium. Now, when it comes to premium, notice there is no premium here because when you buy the bond, if you're an investor, you don't amortize the premium. What you do, every time you receive a payment, you will increase your investment by the premium amount, which is increase your investment. So you don't record the premium, you just simply increase your investment by that amount. So you increase your investments and you earn an additional 5000 So notice the investor received cash and have revenue. The issuing company paid cash and have an expense. The issuing company have an expense and a discount. The the investment the investor company they increase their asset and they increase their revenue. Basically the opposite of each other. Once again, if these entries are confusing you, stop. Don't go and don't proceed any further. Go understand how bonds work, then come back and keep on going. But this is a very brief review. Okay? Now the acquisition of an affiliate outstanding bond from an outsider is considered a constructive retirement by the consolidated entity. So if one of our affiliate bought the bond, it doesn't have to buy the bond directly from us. If they bought it from the market, from someone else, well, it's within the consolidated entity. Then it's constructively retired. The constructive gain or loss is recognized in the consolidated income statement prior to the, to the recognition of gain or loss on the individual book. So simply put, we have to recognize the gain on the loss prior to the recognition of the gain on the loss and the loss on the individual company. So this is a little bit unusual in consolidation. So simply put, before each company record the gain or the loss, the, the gain or the loss will have to be recorded first in the consolidated entity. So in the period the bond are purchased, work papers are ent entries are made to accelerate the recognition of gain or loss. So notice when we buy it, we we prepare work, working paper entries to recognize the gain or the loss. And after the bond is purchased, work paper entries are needed to eliminate the gain or the loss recorded in the period of the books on the of the individual company. Then eventually we'll put that gain or loss on the individual company books. Now we're talking about the gain or the loss. How do we allocate the gain or the loss? There are four methods to allocate the gain or the loss. Okay, so what are those four methods? One is allocated entirely to the issuing company. Okay, so the company that issued the bond should absorb, should record the gain or the loss. Okay, why? Because the purchasing affiliate as a member of the consolidated group is op operating under a common management control. What we assume is it's as if the issuing company bought the bond. They were simply acting as an agent on behalf of the issuing company. So the whole gain or loss is with the, with the issuing company. Or we could put everything with the purchasing company. Well, the company that initiated that transaction should absorb the gain or the loss. Or we can have everything to the parent company, all the gain or the loss. So management of the parent company control the financing, this financing decision of the consolidated affiliate. So now the parent company will have it, whatever, whoever the parent company is. It could be the parent company, could be the issuing company too. Or the fourth method, allocate the purchasing and the issuing company. So allocate, I'm sorry, allocate the gains and the loss between the purchasing company and the issuing company. 
So what happened is we're going to take the law, gain or the loss and allocate it between the two. This method recognizes that a discount or premium will often be associated with both the issuance and the purchase on the open markets. What we're saying is since there's a premium and a discount, let the let each company worry about their premium and their discount. And a gain or a loss will be recognized over the remaining life of the bond as each company amortizes the related discount or premium, either to interest expense, if it's a discount to interest expense, and the premium to interest revenue. Okay, if the bond are held to maturity, the full amount of the gain or the loss will be recognized by the two entities. So eventually, once it mature, what's gained for one party is a loss for another party if we wait till the end. We're going to be using this method to illustrate the concept because basically the other methods, especially the issuing company and the parent company, even the entirely by the purchasing company, it's we cover this in, in one way or another in intermediate in intermediate accounting. Okay, now how do we compute the gain or the loss? Now, let me show you how we compute the gain or the loss when we are dealing with the parent company only. So simply put, when we are dealing with the parent company only, so this is not what we're going to be doing here. What we do is we look at how much cash paid. So how much cash we paid and we compare this to the book value of the bond. If we pay more than the book value, we have a loss. If we cash paid, cash paid is less than the book value, if we paid, we have a gain. Now, if we paid exactly the book value, we have no gain and no loss. This is basically, this formula will apply for one, two, and three. Now, for four, it's going to be a little bit different, okay? On the date of the bond of an affiliate are purchased, a constructive gain or loss is issued. Now, how do we, remember, we're going to have to allocate it between the two. The portion allocated to the issuing company. Now, the issuing company is the company that actually issued the bond within the affiliate. We're going to look at the difference between the book value, which is the carrying value, which is what, what they have on their books, and the par value. Okay? So this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking for the issuing company to determine if we have a gain or a loss. We're going to look at the book value, then compare this to the par value. For the purchasing company, it's the difference between the par value and what they paid and their cost. What the, Their cost is what they paid, okay? There'll be no constructive gain or loss if the bond are issued or purchased at par. So simply put, if the, if the bond was issued at par, issued at par, it means issued at its face value or purchased at its face value, there's no gain and no loss if that's the case. Now let's take a look at different scenarios and how to compute the gain or the loss. Okay, if the issue price and the purchase price were not equal to the par value, so we're assuming they're not equal to the par value, and often they're not equal, there are four possible com combinations that can result. So let's take a look at those four possible combinations. For the issuing company, remember, for the issuing company, we're going to compare the book value to the par value. The book value to the par value. Now let's take a look at the first scenario. We have 110,000 of a book value, but the par value is 100,000. What does that mean, really? What does that mean? Well, it means we received, if the book value is 110 and the par value is 100,000, it means we are dealing with a, hopefully you know this, we are dealing with a premium bond. What does that mean? It means if we're dealing with a premium bond, it means we received more money, more money than the par value. What does that mean? It means if you receive more money than the par value, all that we have to pay at the end is the par value. Therefore, under this scenario, we have a constructive gain. We have a constructive gain. Constructive gain. Now, for the purchasing company, we look at the purchase price, how much they paid versus the par value. And here what they paid is, if you think about it, they paid $85,000. They paid $85,000 right? They paid $85,000 for something, okay, for something that's worth 100000 because once that bond is retired, they, they will get back 100000 Guess what? They have a gain. They have a gain. They have a gain, okay? Now, let's take a look at scenario two. Scenario two, the bond book value is 90000 
Well, 90,000 means the bond, if the part is 100, means this bond is a discount. But when the bond retired, the company will have to pay 100,000. Well, guess what? The company here has a loss, constructive loss of, constructive loss of 10,000. Now, the purchasing company, they paid 115,000. They paid 115,000. They paid that much for something that's going to be worth to them once it retires, once it, once they, once it matures, if they cap it to maturity is 100,000. Well, guess what? They have a loss. They have a loss of 115,000. Okay. Let's take a look at example three and example four. In example three, the book value is 110. What does it mean, the book value 110? It means this bond was initially issued at a premium, and the company, the issuing company, will have to pay only 100,000. Guess what? They have a gain. The purchasing company, they paid 115, but once the bond matured, they're going to get back only 100,000. They have a constructive loss. So notice, the issuing company will have a constructive gain. The purchasing company will have a constructive loss. Overall, for the whole consolidated group, we'll have a 5,000 constructive loss. Can you work this example and see what happened here? Well, let's do it. Book value is 90,000. The bond was issued at a discount. When it matured, we have to pay 100,000. Well, guess what? We are at a loss. The purchasing company paid $85,000 for a bond. If they wait until it matured, they will get 100,000. Well, we have, a, we have a gain there. Overall, we have a constructive gain of $5,000. So this is how we compute constructive gain and constructive loss. Look at it this way. For the issuing company, if the bond was issued at a premium, they will have a gain. If the bond is issued at a premium, they will have a gain under this scenario. Why? Because what they have to pay, they always have to pay the face value. The face value is less than the less. The face value is always less than a premium bond. Okay. Now, for the purchasing company, it depends if they paid more or less. But think think of it this way. And if it's a discount bond, they will have a loss for the issuing company because the bond already at a discount, and they have to pay the, the full value at maturity. Therefore, they have to come up with the difference. They will have a loss. That's for the issuing company. The best way to illustrate this is to actually. Get our feet wet and work an example. We have P Company owns 90% of the outstanding stock of S Company. So we have 90%, okay? During 2012, S Company issued a half a million par value bond for 520. So notice S Company, the subsidiary, per, uh, issued the bond at a premium. It's, it's a 10 year life bond and paid 6% interest. In 2014, P Company bought the entire bond issue at the open market for 450. So the parent company bought the bond of an affiliate. Both companies uses the straight line method to amortize the premium or the discount. The income and dividend for both companies are as follow. So we have the income for P company, the dividend, the income for S company and the dividend. Oops. Okay. So the first thing they want us to do is to compute the total gain or loss on the constructive, uh, retirement of the debt. So we have to know the um, gain or loss, the total, the total, they're asking for the total, the total gain or loss. All right, so the total, this is, they're as, not asking for a specific company, they're asking for the total. Well, to compute the total, it's how much we paid, how much we paid for the bond. So how much did we pay? We paid for the bond, paid 450. We paid 450. Now what we have to do, we have to figure out what's the book value of the bond. Okay, what's the book value of the bond? Now, when the bond was originally issued, it was issued at 520,000. That was the book value. It means it has a discount of 20,000. That discount will have to be amortized over 10 years. So every year we are gonna be amortizing $2,000. We're gonna be amortizing, sorry. We're going to be amortizing $2,000. Now, we issued the bond in 2012, and we retired it in 2014. So we're going to go with two years of amortization. So we're going to amortize minus 4000 of premium. So the book value when we issued the bond is 516000 Now, we have a bond with a book value of 516 We paid for it 450 
Well, guess what? Overall, total is we have a gain. We're going to have a gain. We're going to have a gain of the difference between those two and the difference between 450 and 516. What we paid in the book value is 66 thousand because the question is asking for the full amount the total gain or total loss okay hopefully we get this all right now second question allocate the total gain and the total loss above to p and to s now remember now this is a different formula now we have to allocate the sixty six thousand to each one for the subs for the uh, issuing company Smokey is the issuing company what we do is we look at the book value and the book value was 516 we already computed the book value now we're gonna compare the book value to the par value the par value is 500,000 guess what I issued the bond above the par value all what I have to pay back is the par value I have a gain of 16,000 that's the gain for the issuer for the issuer and the issuer happens to be s company now for p company p company is the comp the purchasing company now the purchasing company it happens to be also the p company the purchase company they paid they paid how much they paid they paid 450 for the bond well we're going to take the difference between what they paid what they paid and the par value they paid 50,000 less so P company or the parent company which happens to be called the Pearl Pearl will have a gain of 50,000 so this is how we allocated the gain together that's 66,000 and this is what we computed in the first question how much was the total gain 66,000 how much is allocated to each well the issuing company will take the book value versus the par value for the purchasing company it's the par value versus the purchase price the par value versus the purchase price but we allocate the gain to the two different companies let's take a look at part C prepare the entries for Pearl and Smokey company that they would record in 2014 so let's start with the P company Pearl what did the parent company do well the parent company made an investment although it's an investment in their subsidiary nevertheless it's an investment therefore we debit investment in bonds which is an asset 450 this is how much they paid and they will credit cash 450,000 now, what would an investment in, bond, in bonds gives you? The investment in bond will generate interest revenue. Therefore, the interest revenue is $30,000. Why $30,000? It's 6% and a half a million dollar bond. So if per year, the subsidiary will pay $30,000. Well, we're going to debit cash, credit revenue, interest revenue, $30,000. Now bear in mind, bear in mind, I know I'm, I'm setting the ground for this, that this is from S company, this interest revenue from S company. It's a subsidiary. Well, guess what? We're receiving revenue, intercompany revenue. What do we have to do? Eventually we have to kind of eliminate those revenues and we're gonna see how indirectly how it works. Now, what else do we have to do? Are we done yet? No, when we bought this bond, when P company bought this bond, they bought the bond at a $50,000 discount. Remember they paid 450. Now this $50,000 discount will be amortized over eight years because this is the remaining life of the bond. Therefore, every year we have to amortize for revenue so it's going to be increase our revenue 6250 so we're going to debit investment in bond credit interest revenue 6250 why because we bought the bond at a discount now for the investor which is p company we don't amortize it uh, we don't we don't have a premium notice it's amortized for interest revenue okay we don't have a premium for the investor okay because we are the investor not the invest Yes, we are the investor here, okay? Now, what would Smokey do? Well, remember also before we proceed this interest revenue, this is intercompany revenue because this revenue coming technically from S company because when the bond mature, they have to pay us back half a million. Therefore, we have an extra 50,000, but that 50,000 coming from our subsidiary. S company, they will have to debit interest expense 30,000, credit cash 30,000 because they have to pay us 30,000. Notice what happened here. 
This is interest expense paying the P company. So this interest expense and this interest revenue technically cancel each other out. This debit to cash and this credit to cash cancel, cancel each other out. Now we did not cancel this entry, right? We're gonna take care of this later. But I just wanna show you that I want you to be in that realm of intercompany transaction. Now what else? You remember, when, when S company issued this bond, they issued this bond at a premium. They issued the bond at five at 520 and they were amortizing $2,000. So every year they have to debit premium on bond and credit interest expense of $10,000. Once again, remember this interest expense now technically is intercompany because this interest expense, uh, this interest expense is part of, a, of an intercompany transaction because who holds the bond? The parent company. So this is the entries that they make. Now, obviously we have to look at the elimination entries at the end. Now, uh, I believe we did this. Yeah, we did prepare the journal entries for both. Uh, use the information compute the controlling interest in the consolidated net income and the non-controlling interest. Okay, now we're gonna uh, compute the controlling interest and the non-controlling interest. Right. We can do this here. So compute the controlling interest and the non-controlling interest because we have all the data here. Well, P reported $100,000 of revenue. So we're gonna start with P net income. P, let's start here. P net income, they reported $100,000. Let's keep it here, $100,000. Now, of this $100,000, remember, because S company gave them dividend of $20,000, we have to back out the dividend. Less, because we only have to account for, for revenue, uh, less 90% of 20,000 dividend, which is 90% times 20,000. So we have to deduct from this amount 18,000. Okay, so what's what's the income from independent operation is 82,000. Then we're gonna have to add the gain on constructive gain because that gain is to them constructive gain and the constructive gain if we remember the constructive gain for p company how much was it let's go back i forgot the construct the constructive gain for p company is fifty thousand therefore we had to add up the constructive gain of fifty thousand so so the and it's, uh, we have 132 and that's pearl contribution to the consolidated statement Okay. Now also, P, since it's the parent company, they're going to get the portion that S reported. Well, S net income, S net income reported 75,000. So they're going to also get S net income. So S net income is 75,000. Then S also had constructive gain add constructive gain add constructive gain of 16,000 because we allocated 50 to the parent so this is going to be their contribution is 91,000 okay now remember of this 91,000 the parent company is going to absorb 90% because we're 90% owner therefore that's going to be 81,900 okay so therefore the controlling interest is 213 900 so this is the controlling this is the controlling interest consolidated net income now what is the non-controlling interest easy if it's 10 percent so it's 91,000 we said s if 90 percent goes to the parent company 10 percent is for the minority or the non-controlling so that's going to be 9,100. This is the non-controlling and this is the controlling interest. So this is the consolidated income for the controlling, non-controlling interest. And that was the question. Let's take a look at the eliminating entries. Prepare the eliminating entries necessary to eliminate intercompany transaction. Now, what do we have to eliminate? Remember, we computed the bond, the, cons the, the bond gain, the constructive gain 
on the retirement of the bond. But we did not we did not add the transaction to each company. We did not add the transaction to P. We did not add the transaction to S. Remember, for bonds, once we have a gain or a loss, we book it right there for the consolidated. That then at the end of the year, we have to add the gain to each sep to each company separately. So remember, investment in bond was fifty thousand will have to be increased for P company. So P company had part of the bond fifty thousand dollars. So this is the gain for P company. So they have, remember, we computed $50,000 of gain. Now we have to book the gain on P company books. S company had a gain of 16,000. Well, what's gonna happen? They were gonna debit the premium on bonds payable for 16,000 and credit the gain. Same thing, what we are doing in these two entries, we are recording the gain on S, on S books and on P books, because those gains, they will need to be recorded separately. 50,000 for P, 16,000 for S, we, we computed earlier. Now, what else do we have to do? Remember, P company bought the bond from S company. This is an intra-company transaction. Well, we have to eliminate the investment and we have to eliminate the bond because the bond is no longer outstanding. If, if P company bought it, it's part of our company. So part of the consolidated. So we debit bonds payable, and we credit investments. This way, bonds is gone and the investment is gone. Okay, now what else do we have to do? If you remember what I told you earlier, that the in interest revenue that we amortize and the interest expense that we amortize, that those are intercompany interest and revenue. So what do we have to do? We have to eliminate the interest revenue of 62.50. We debit interest revenue of 62.50 we credit investment and bond of 62.50. You know, you might be saying, why did we do this? Well, let me show you. And I kind of planted the ground when I did this. I told you when we, when we eventually we're gonna have to eliminate, let me highlight this in yellow. I told you eventually we have to eliminate this and this is what I just did. And as I also told you, we're gonna have to eliminate this entry, which we're gonna be doing next. So we eliminate this interest, inter-revenue interest and we have to eliminate the reduction in the expense. Therefore, we debit expense, we, we basically reverse the entry, we debit expense and credit premium on bond payable. So those two entries basically reversal of what we did earlier when we recorded the transaction. Now, if you're having any difficulty with this topic, I'm gonna tell you why. The reason why, it's not because this topic is difficult, it is challenging, I'm not saying it's not challenging, but the reason could be because you don't have your prerequisite. What does that mean? It means if you're really having difficulty in this topic or in this chapter, go back to my intermediate accounting, chapter 14, and I cover bonds in depth. Bonds is on the CPA exam, heavily covered. So you need to understand how bonds work. This chapter, advanced accounting assume you have mastered intermediate accounting. Therefore, if that's not the case, go back and take care of this. If you have any questions about this stop, this recording, email me. If you happen to visit my website for additional lectures, please consider donating, study hard for your CPA exam, and see you on the other side of success.